so as John said, um, I'm just going to recap some survey results quickly from a survey that we ran in 2019, um, talking about software requirements that people have in acoustics. And also I've, I've got some, uh, some of the results that we had from the, the survey that we sent around ahead of this workshop. Obviously we haven't had time to do much analysis on those yet, but you'll uh, start to get a, a glimpse of who we've got in the room and what our needs are before we start our discussions uh, shortly. So um, let me just make sure my mouse is working. Yes, okay. So the first survey that I'm talking about is one that we sent around uh, in the UCAN newsletter. Uh, it, it was posted in April and in May 2019 and we asked people, um, the quote was, some particular questions around your use of software. Um, so this wasn't necessarily a computational acoustics software on its own, um, it might have been any type of acoustic software. We had 58 responses to that, and uh, which is available on the UCAN website, which I believe John has shared with you now. Um, so please feel free to go and look at that. But just to give you the sort of headline results that are relevant today, um, we asked people what application areas they were using computational methods in, and they were able to choose more than one response. Um, so there are more responses here than there were people. Um, but you can see there's a huge majority of people studying noise. Um, but then from left to right, we also have architecture in the built environment, sound absorbing materials, transport, vibrational analysis, underwater acoustics, aeroacoustics, metamaterials, non-destructive evaluation and structural health, biomedical applications, medical diagnostics, medical therapeutics, bioacoustics, speech and communication, process monitoring and characterization, and other. So as you can see, Computational methods are being used across a, a wide range of um, options and, and areas within acoustics. That was, those were all the options we gave. So we had at least sort of two or three responses for every single option and then some other as well. Um, we did ask people what kind of computational methods they were using. And I should note that this was prior to the formation of the mathematical acoustics group. Um, so we had mathematical as one category. So I apologise to members of the mathematical acoustics group who will want more detail than this. Um, but we do go into a little bit more detail in a moment. Uh, but as you can see, sort of the, the usual suspects in here, finite element, boundary element, hybrid methods and so on. Um, we asked people what specific software they were using and the first question we asked was whether you were using commercial software or not. Um, most people were, many were using in-house solutions um, and a few were using open source and I will note here that people could only choose one of these options so maybe actually that people were using more than more than one of these things um, but for our purposes here today um, it was more than half of the people in total um, I think combined who ended up using commercial software but there was still a clear large minority using in-house solutions or open source. Um, the most commonly used software, so people when we had more than five responses in the data were CADNA, Consol, Multiphysics, Insol, Odeon, MATLAB and CAT and across all software um, these were reported for, for everything, for in-house code that people have made themselves, for everything. Um, we, we were encountering problems with unfriendly interfaces, steep learning curves, occasional spurious results. I will say that was more to do with the commercial software, I believe. Cost certainly was, um, but also that they're particularly highly specialised to the application and interoperability was a huge problem for, for all software that people mentioned. We asked people what their principal challenges were with the methods, so they could choose one of skills, software or technical problems or no problems or other. Um, so with skills, we're talking about whether skilled staff were available. The software itself was more to do with using it and in the interface and technical challenges encompassed um, problems with the, the application area and the development of the algorithms themselves. So as you can see, technical problems were the clear winner here, but there were still at least 10 people with software or skills issues. Um, and when we asked for more detail upon that, um, I broke this down into sort of five main categories. So the main problems that people had were, number one, and these are in order of, of sort of popularity, computational expense. So we're talking about things like running time, uh, trading off with accuracy of your simulations, especially where you start to get into really complicated simulation conditions and large simulations. Um, the second most common challenge was lacking of appropriate knowledge. 
Um, so you require, as we mentioned earlier, not just domain specific knowledge, but also appropriate technical skills to use the software. Um, and how do we get those staff, retain those staff, fund those staff? Um, complex simulation conditions. I'm not going to go into too much detail about this because I think that's sort of on a case by case basis, but basically um, software is required that can handle complex simulation conditions. Um, the next most common problem was uh, incorporating new methods into particularly into commercial software, but really into software in general and particularly interfacing between different pieces of software for multi scale problems. And then finally, um, issues with the specific pieces of software themselves. So as I mentioned earlier, steep learning curves, unfriendly interfaces, um, lacks of standardization across different packages, reliability, and of course, cost. The next thing we asked was um, whether anyone had any other challenges that they wanted to mention. And I've put these in a sort of rough order. So in first, uh, place was computational expense, which I think we have already covered earlier, but it appears again because it's such a big deal in computational acoustics. Um, equal second were learning curve issues and calibration and validation. Um, so again, things we've covered. Equal fourth, we had understanding of the fundamentals of the algorithms being used and incorporating new technologies, perhaps ones that we don't necessarily associate with these sort of traditional acoustics methods. And finally, in equal sixth, we had uh, incorporating open access data, where to get appropriate, accurate material properties, um, all the different software versions and fees and licenses and all the things that we have, and maintaining um, an ongoing code base. So to summarize the results of that first survey, um, Shaib already has shown uh, these uh, bullet points and you can look at them in more detail but basically to summarize the sort of solutions that we might be looking for um, are the development of a, a sort of a knowledge base including validation and benchmarking type of resources um, more training and perhaps some standards to allow us to uh, interoperate between software so all of these things uh, tie into this this idea of a community of practice which we'll be discussing and then very, very quickly, um, I just want to show you before we go into our discussion rooms about uh, the survey that we ran before this uh, workshop. You can still do it if you haven't done it yet. Um, you should have had the link in the email and I'm sure John can pop it in the chat as well. So this is just to, we, this is just to give you a quick rundown of what we've got already. But um, we will be using the full survey at the end of the day to inform any more decisions going forward. So please do fill it out if you haven't already. Um, so we have 28 responses at quarter past two, so let's see what they look like. So we asked people how important research software is to your work and on a scale from not at all to vital, um, a clear majority of people find it vital. There's no one in our responses who said it was not at all important, so that's got to be a good sign. Um, we asked people how they rate their software development expertise um, from beginner to professional and as you can see we, we don't have any people saying that they are professional. So there's a clear case here for, for more training at all levels, especially um, towards the left hand side of that graph. Uh, we asked about a few specific technologies, um, many of these we've heard about already today, so uh, whether people felt confident or whether they'd even heard of um, using version control, continuous integration, unit testing, um, software containers and writing documentation and as you can see there tends to be fewest of all people saying they're very confident with each of these things and plenty of people saying they're not confident so that again there's a clear case for training within these specific technologies within our community that we have today. Um, we also asked people how they would rate their institution's current level of support for this um, and on the scale from poor to excellent as you can see a majority of people said it was okay um, but there's obviously a desire for more support, um, whether that's institutional or from external to the institution. And further to that, we did ask people um, how each of these models would be suitable for their needs. So we've got, could they hire a full-time software developer, recruit a developer from a pool in the institution as needed, or from a pool outside the institution as needed. And as you can see, um, all three options are suitable for a lot of people. Um, and perfect in some cases and unsuitable in others. So I think there is uh, a feeling here that there isn't one right solution to how to do this, but we need to be aware that um, different teams and different institutions will have different needs. 
So just to summarise that up very quickly, um, I think we can conclude from, from the 28 responses that we've had so far that research software is important in this community, but that there is room to improve expertise, particularly with some of these specific technologies that we mentioned. Institutional support is generally insufficient, which suggests that there's a clear case for some kind of external community, such as a community of practice.